Archaeology can be described as building up a story of our past, and archaeologists have a toolkit of different things that they can use in order to construct the story of our past. The first item in the toolkit is dating methods. These can be divided into absolute dating methods or relative dating methods. Absolute dating methods will always give an exact date in calendar years. For example, 4503 BP before present. Examples of absolute dating methods include carbon-14 dating, which looks at the length of time it is since an object has been alive and exposed to the atmosphere. Potassium argon dating, which looks at the decay of potassium into argon, particularly in volcanic layers, and can be useful for dating fossils which may be in or between volcanic layers. Thermoluminescence data, dating, as the name thermo suggests, looks at the length of time since an object was last heated is particularly useful for pottery. Related to this is a method called optically stimulated luminescence, which looks at the length of time since an object was last exposed to light. Amino acid racemization looks at the changes in amino acids over time. And one of the earliest dating methods used by archaeologists is something called dendrochronology. Chronology obviously having to do with time, dendro having to do with trees. Dendrochronology actually looks at tree rings in cut through sections of trees over time. The tree rings vary according to environmental conditions and be, can be compared with, them, with each other, rings from different trees, in order to build up a sequence through time. And then that can be l related to, carb to calendar dates by doing, for example, carbon-14 dating of the trees. A similar method is obsidian hydration. Obsidian is a type of volcanic glass that was favoured by ancient people for its very sharp edge. As soon as obsidian is exposed to air, so for example when an object is made and a piece of obsidian is broken off, it begins to absorb water out of the air, which is where the hydration comes from, and it forms a hydration layer on that surface that's exposed to the air, and by measuring that hydration layer we can work out how old it is how long it is since that surface was exposed to the air. Now both dendrochronology and obsidian hydration dating can also be used as relative dating methods. Relative dating methods aren't tied to a particular calendar date, but you might look at a tree and decide, well this one is clearly older than that tree because its sequence of rings fit further back than this one. And that's how dendrochronology was used originally before they were able to use carbon-14 to build up the exact sequence of years. And in a similar way you can compare the hydration layers on different levels of obsidian. One of the most famous relative dating methods is actually seriation, which looks at the changes in form of an object over time. So for instance if we look at an amphora, a type of ancient jug, we might find that over time people decided the pointy bit on the bottom wasn't very practical and they made a flat base and then over time they might have decided that actually they needed it to be shorter and wider and finally they might have decided that actually a very flat wide base jug was really most suitable for them. This might happen over hundreds of years. When an archaeologist then finds a jug of the same sort in an excavation they can compare it to the others and say well this one is most similar to this one in my sequence, in my seriation and therefore I know that the the site that this object comes from is probably the same time period as the site from which these objects were found. Now, sequences through time are one of the main things that archaeologists use and perhaps the most important use of sequence through time is stratigraphy, which is understanding the layers under the ground. And if we have a look, we might have a ground surface here on which there were dinosaurs and dinosaurs over time Maybe this dinosaur died, its body decomposed, turned into bones. And over time, the wind blew, dust and debris was blown in, covered over the bones, perhaps it rained, flood waters brought in extra layers, and the ground actually builds up, hiding that skeleton. Many millions of years later, some humans come along and they're in the same place as that dinosaur bone but they don't realize it's there because it's under the ground. They make a fire, they build a, they um, make a stone axe for hunting, they manage to hunt some animal and cook and eat the animal on their fire. They discard the bones, 
they discard the um, ash and charcoal from the fire and perhaps they move on. Again, over time, the wind blows, dust and debris builds up and the ground level rises again. The next group of people that come along decide, well, we quite like this valley, so we're going to build a little village here and live here for a while. Perhaps these people have made metal spears. They might um, build their fireplaces and discard their ash and charcoal, their animal bones that they're eating, and generally anything that's broken. Perhaps they have some pottery at this stage, and when things get broken, they throw it away in the rubbish dump. Dust and debris gets blown in, the rain washes more stuff in, and the ground surface rises yet again. More people come, or perhaps these same people's descendants over time build a different type of house. They perhaps have furniture with quite elaborate pottery, teapots and cups. They might have an oven in which to make bread, which generates a lot of ash and charcoal that they throw into their dump, along with the broken bits of pottery, the bones of the animals that they've eaten. And again, dust and debris builds up, the ground level rises. Somebody comes along in an old car that they've treasured for many years, but this car has now finally stopped working. It gets taken apart. The wheels are thrown here, the windscreen smashed over there. It's added into perhaps a municipal rubbish dump. And over time, that rubbish dump becomes full and is probably deliberately buried. The basic premise here, and what's most important to realise, is that as you go deeper underground, generally speaking, the material becomes older and older. So when the archaeologists come and do their excavation, as they dig down through these different layers, they're digging back further and further and further into the past. So for example, the archaeologists might start on this layer at the top and discover the material there from that tip is about 50 years old. As they go further down, they discover this material here and by comparing it to other things that they know about using relative dating they know that this material is about 500 years old. They go even further down and now they can't just compare the material, perhaps they've got some ash and charcoal here they can use for carbon dating. They discover that this material down here is about 5,000 years old. Similarly, ash and charcoal gives carbon-14 dates and they date this layer to 8,000 years old. And of course, right at the bottom, they compare the dinosaur bones to others that have been dated by perhaps potassium argon dating, and they know that this layer is 65 million years old. Now, this material that they're digging up in the course of this excavation is what we call material culture. This is the artifacts, such as those stone axes or pottery jugs and cups that come out of the sequence, the features, such as the houses or the fireplaces filled with ash and charcoal. The combination of the features and the artifacts tell us what activities were done by people in which areas. And then of course the faunal remains are the bones of the animals which were eaten, which tell us about the diet of the people living there. And it's by putting all of these things together and understanding their place and their sequence through time that archaeologists are able to build up a story of our past.